Presented by Caltech. I'm very happy to uh, have you here at the first distinguished lecture for the Chen Center of Social and Decision Neuroscience. Tian Kiao and Tian Tian Chrissy Chen, as many of you know, extremely generously endowed a, a Chen Institute of Neurosciences in which there are five major scientific centers. One is social and decision neuroscience, which is basically human neuroscience about fairly complex high-level systems choices. You'll see an example today. <clears throat> and um, we were very happy to invite Wilfram Schultz to give the first lecture. Wolfram is in the Department of Physiology, Development, and Neuroscience at Cambridge, England. He's a fellow also of Churchill College there. He's a visiting research associate here. We've been very happy and lucky to have Wolfram come uh, every spring for several years, originally sponsored by the Conti Center, uh, NIH, which Ralph Adolph direct. Um, Wolfram has won a slew of prizes. I'll mention just two. The, he's a fellow of the Royal Society, 2009. Just this year, he uh, shared with Peter, uh, Diane, and Ray Dolan uh, the Brain Prize for their work on the computational basis of reward and decision making. Um, we thought that Wolfram was a wonderful person to have give this inaugural lecture because um, he has both contributed greatly to and continues to exemplify, you'll see some really new results, computational approach. And in the what we call computational neuroscience, decision <coughs> neuroscience, we strive to figure out what numbers are being computed and being encoded by brain activity such as neural firing rates or bold signal from fMRI, which are then associated with behavior in order to understand the process of valuation and decision making and maybe permit causal statements, look at individual differences, and so forth. Uh, and a final thing, if you want to join our mailing list, we'd love if you can do that. There's a little card, a low-tech card outside you can fill in. So without further ado, uh, Professor Wolfram Schultz. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, I think uh, I've given probably some lectures in the past years that you may have heard, including two weeks ago, where I gave a lecture that's about 60% overlap with today's lecture, because I just don't have enough imagination to put up more stuff. That gives you the chance to do these intermittent uh, short naps, which I understand are the most efficient ones for regeneration, then you're all set for tonight. And it gives me the chance to remember my talk, actually. So um, I, I won't talk, I'm sorry, about human work. I just got too much slides. And it, I, I'm sure it will take an hour and a half or two hours to get through all the slides. What's the reward? We need the, the primary rewards are food, liquids, without which we cannot survive for more than a few days, a sex without, without which our genes won't survive. And then we need additional things that make our life more happy and make us get more rewards, like ice cream, which is producing addiction, besides the drugs of addiction that are made <laughs> basically for the addiction. Um, uh, rewards involve risk, as you can see, every day. Um, rewards make you, or at least some albatrosses, um, fly over the southern Atlantic Ocean for, in this case, about 8,000 miles on a foraging flight. Um, rewards, rewards make you happy when you discover something, like Jean-Francois Champollion, the Rosetta Stone. Um, the, the Heracles on the Rosetta Stone rewards can have very abstract um, uh, meanings and value. And the whole idea is, of course, this is a reward that will ultimately boil down um, to make you get more food and more liquid because this reward will make you relax and think of other things and change your mind and then you are more competitive in the environment which makes you get more safely food and liquid rather than engaging in a warfare and destroying absolutely everything including your own uh, well-being. Uh, rewards make you happy. You don't see that. This is too dark here. This is myself somewhere here and this is the inebriated state after a good dose of sushi um, accompanied by beer and sake. Uh, if you have the right hormones, this is a reward for you. Maserati, just go outside on the street and you'll see it. And then, of course, the uh, rewards are very important if you want to start a Chen Center, right? Um, this is the so-called common currency to which everything boils down in human society and in which we can also uh, um, formulate the rewards for animals. The so-called common currency value that serves as a reference for absolutely every other reward. So the, the units of that um, 
um, common currency reward then determines the value of all other rewards relative to this preference. Okay? Um, rewards have um, three major functions, at least in our eyes. We can discuss all of these uh, details here, and I'm sure not everybody agrees. Rewards make you learn and come back for more of this stuff. You learn what these fruits mean, and then you may like this one or may not like that one enough or so, but you learn that. These are arbitrary stimuli that become reward predicting stimuli because when you go and take these, then you get actually whatever it is in this orange or so. Right. Rewards make you approach them. From punishers, you will, of course, hopefully run away. And uh, this is from a petrol station in Barstow, not too far from here, in which there's a sign, don't put your hand in the candy. These are candy dispensers. You take a little bag and then fill it up. It takes a while to make that picture because everybody has their damn hands in the candy. Okay. And then, of course, rewards are supposed to make you happy. I'm sorry, this is a little dark here. My slides are just too dark. This is a pig, one of my friends, to whom I can talk. Uh, you can talk to, fr to, to pigs, you can talk to monkeys, you can talk to humans. You understand what, they, what they're doing. Uh, I'm, I have more difficulties just talking to cockroaches and Drosophila. Um, so these rewards produce, in principle, positive emotions and mental states like desires. When you get a reward, you, have, you hopefully have experience pleasure, um, and that produces a longer-lasting state of happiness. And once you know this, these rewards, then you may desire them, and then the whole thing becomes purposeful, goal-directed, and goes all the way into free will. Okay? Um, so in animals, we're not, we're not claiming that we can um, measure these emotions, and, and therefore we're basically neglecting it. Although I have to say that probably most rewards derive their rewarding function from the pleasure they generate, if you think about all these fruits here. We don't necessarily need this fruit more badly than this one because they contain probably the same vitamins and the same amounts of liquid. We still get more pleasure out of that reward compared to that reward, and therefore we prefer this reward than this reward, and we say this reward has a higher value for us compared to, to that reward here, right? So the pleasure is actually something that tells us the value, but we can't measure it in animals. Okay? So any stimulus that has any of these three functions is by definition a reward. These rewards are there to make us survive. That's what I call the proximal reward function. Ultimately, we need to not only survive for the moment, but we need to have a good environment for our offspring. Um, and then we, we will be talking of evolutionary competition, evolutionary um, uh, survival. And uh, this, this is basically what the three reward functions do. They should maximize, hopefully, um, the reward value in terms of the evolutionary fitness in the long range. Right? So any, any individual, any organism that has a good reward system that provides the best reward for that organism will be the one that's going to survive the evolutionary competition. Okay. So then we were working on dopamine neurons and trying to find movement-related activity because we were conceptually based on Parkinson's disease, which is a dopamine deficiency and has severe movement disorders. And we were recording in the midbrain from the dopamine neurons whose axons project into the frontal cortex and the striatum and a few other areas. And then we, this is a dopamine neuron, um, uh, relatively small. Um, and then we take a microelectrode, out, stay outside of the neuron. It's too unstable to do an intracellular recording and get a waveform from this neuron. So we have a time course here. This, this is maybe a millisecond or a couple of milliseconds, I should say. Then we translate that into a um, electronic pulse that's suitable for a computer. We test a monkey in the laboratory and the animal reaches into a food box. It gets a little piece of apple. It's a very nice apple. I perfectly, personally like the apple so I can understand the monkeys as I mentioned, and they go in that food box, but if they go too often, we don't put food in there. So the food they encounter in there, they cannot look into the box, they can just reach it from underneath, is kind of surpri partly surprising. And when we look, when we take these impulses from a single dopamine neuron in this area here, and plot the time at which this TTL signal occurs, then we see that the frequency of these pulses are a little bit after higher, a little bit after the movement onset. That means after the animal releases this resting key and moves into the food box, right? And this is one trial after the other, one movement after the other, and that's the sum of it here. But, but is this a movement activity? Because what, that's what we were going after for the Parkinson's disease, and the answer is unfortunately no. This is when the animal touches the piece of food that's stuck on the touch-sensitive wire that produces another TTL signal for 
referencing the time of touch here on a computer, we see that when the animal touches this thing afterwards, we, we see afterwards this response. But when the animal does the same movement, it fools around in here actually maybe even more, and more sensory stimulation, everything more, except there's no food in this empty wire here, we don't see a response. So it's not, it's not a, a movement at all. We understand that if you we actually published a paper uh, before that, where we saw when the animal does big movements, some slow activation, and maybe one third of the neurons. And whenever we do more controlled movements, it disappeared. It was very embarrassing. We had published a full paper on movement relationship of dopamine neurons. And then the movement relationship disappeared whenever we tested proper movements in the terms of motor control, if you're familiar with this part in neuroscience. And now people working on rodents that start running on a treadmill, activating their 352 muscles, will find the same activation during, during the movement, uh, which is quite a, kind, kind of interesting. So we're talking of this very basic signal that's much sharper than any slower activation of, with movements. And I'm, the rest of this talk, at least on dopamine cells, will be on this phasic signal here. So what is this phasic signal really? You've got to go and do a proper test, not this fooling around in food boxes or so. You give the animal a drop of liquid at the mouth repeatedly, like 20 times. Repeatedly, we see that every time after that reward, drop of liquid, uh, grape, grape juice or something, we get a few more extra action potential, not a whole lot. But uh, there is about 100,000 of these neurons on each side in the brain in a monkey, and about 80% of them show that response. So it's quite a, quite a nice volume, big response that lasts maybe two, 300 milliseconds. If you give a stimulus that predicts that reward, then we don't get a response here anymore, and the response moves over to the stimulus, which is kind of funny. And if you're a little obsessed, like us and like to play in the laboratory and got nothing better to do, then of course sometimes you won't give a reward here. And then you see that the activity of this neuron is depressed, right? And the, the, the response still stays there because the stimulus predicts the reward, but you're withholding the reward by clamping the liquid line or something, or the error, animal making an error and not getting a reward. Right? So that is a bit suspicious, and then we kind of made a little calculation and realized that the response of these neurons are governed by the difference between the reward they're receiving and the reward that is predicted. So here nothing is predicted in time, nothing is predicted, and the reward comes out of nowhere, bam, suddenly a drop of liquid. Here the reward is predicted by the stimulus one and a half seconds before, the reward comes, everything is predicted, you get nothing. And here the reward is predicted. Right? You get a prediction back here, but you get no reward. So this equation then is negative. Right? Um, Rescola Wagner called that the associative strength, the difference in associative strengths actually had a more, even more complicated word, which was totally hopeless to pass across an audience that wants to have a straight, straight explanation of these very surprising data that nobody had seen before. We called it unpredictability in a paper. And then came, of course, the idea with the analogy with the reinforcement models, and that nailed the term of reward prediction error. Now, this is really terrible, because reward to prediction error means that you, you're making an error and you're getting a reward. That's what my colleagues tell me. It's bad. But the idea is that this is, well, this is the, um, this reward prediction error, lambda minus v, is the crucial learning term in these asymptotic learning theories like Roscola Wagner or temporal difference learning, and this is exactly what these neurons are coding. So um, the idea of prediction error comes from this general circuit diagram of error-driven learning that you may have seen when you looked at control theory at, at uh, undergraduates, right? You start out with a prediction, you get some outcome, um, you, gener you, you look, you compare the two, maybe they're different, then you say, well, that occurs when you made an error, or it's actually the error is simply the discrepancy between these two terms, and, and then you um, update the prediction with this error, and next time, hopefully, your prediction is a little bit better, and then the prediction error gradually becomes smaller and smaller, and as you change your prediction, of course, you change your behavior, right? That's why it is called learning. And then after a while, if, there, if the prediction matches the outcome, note that the outcome doesn't change, the prediction gets adapted, right? Um, then you don't change the prediction any longer because if you're right on target, you get your, your reward, you won't change anything in your behavior. You just keep pressing the same button to get the same can of Coke, okay? Um, right. 
Um, then, of course, we're talking of, we're talking of learning theory here. We need to run a little learning experiment. We did a number of learning experiments. So this actually came partly out of a much more complicated learning experiment because in the beginning when, you, when we're fishing around, we're making everything super complicated. Now we had to do it a little simple. I'm sorry, the colors are... This, this says similar pairs in reward discrimination learning task. And this is a stimulus that the animal touches, gets a reward. This is a stimulus if the animal touches, it doesn't get a reward. A very simple, straightforward uh, a discrimination task. And of course, then you can take arbitrary stimuli, compose them on the computer. If you're familiar with the Apple Macintosh um, fonts, then you can get these by overlaying these pictures with the color subtraction procedure, very easy to do. And this reads new stimulus one or something. I can't even read it here. Learn one. Right? And, and of course, the animals, you, you show them picture set after picture set. This is ultimately the rewarder stimulus. This is ultimately the unrewarder stimulus. And as the animal sees more of those, they learn to learn. They get into what's called a learning set. And after a couple of hundred of these so-called learning problems, pairs of stimuli, they learn within a few trials. Right? So you can test a neuron during the whole period of learning. Normally, we can hold a neuron for 20, 30, maybe 40, 40 minutes, but not for three days that a standard monkey would take to learn uh, such a stimulus pair, right? So we train these stimulus first for several weeks or months, and then, then we have them as reference stimuli, um, fully learned stimuli, and then we use these new stimuli, one pair, and then uh, three hours later, another pair, another pair, and the animal learns while we have a neuron, learns completely the stimuli, and I'm not boring you in the details of the learning curve, it's all standard. What I'm telling you, trying to tell you, is that initially during the learning, the chance of getting it right to touching the correct stimulus that is the reward stimulus is 50%, right? So you have a reward probability of 50%. That means if you do get it right by chance, you have a plus 50% prediction error. Your prediction is 50%, you get a reward, reward 100% minus 50% prediction is 50% prediction error. You get a 50% prediction error. As the animal learns more and more, and then we can establish some arbitrary learning criterion like three out of four, um, uh, correct uh, responses. Um, the first time, that's the learning criterion for full. Then you see that the response gradually decreases. Some people say there's a little jump here, I'm not sure. And then gradually decreases. And at the end, after maybe 60 trials or so, the animal pretty much gets it right. That means the reward prediction goes from 50 to 70 to 80 to 90 to 95 percent. And the prediction error um, gets, in parallel, very small. If the animal gets it wrong, and that's again is the first trial here, you, you get the 50, negative 50% reward prediction error, and that negative pr prediction error also, uh, this, um, well, it stays basically up to here, okay, all the way down here. Um, so what you're saying, what I'm saying is we get these prediction errors also during very formal learning tests, okay? And then if you take the whole thing together, and um, I'm jumping a little bit here, I, this is a general lecture, um, the optimal control theory, out of which came machine learning and reinforcement learning, postulate that the reward prediction errors that have a direction, they have a, a good a war, positive reward prediction error is something good, a negative reward prediction error is something bad, it's not just a deviation, a valueless deviation, they drive agents towards better states. The Bellman equation, dynamic programming, Harry Klopf, the temporal difference learning by Sutton and Bartow, all of this, in particular the Sutton Bartow model is very similar to our dopamine um, responses. All of this is beneficial for getting the best reward, actually, not just some reward, but getting better and better and better reward. And, and I'm going to show this a little bit more detail. This is really what we want. We want an agent that's not just getting a reward, right? Anybody can get a reward. What you want is the best reward out of the available rewards, because then your chance of survival is high. Maybe not in our an environment, but 300 years ago when we were roaming the woods, if you only get these bad rewards, you're not going to make it over periods where there is no food at all or, or where you're hungry. You want to be a little bit obese to be able to survive periods of hunger, right? So here are my stimuli that make me survive periods of hunger here, right, with the um, appropriate liquid accompanied, like a little bit of a bottle of sake, these 1.8 liter bottles, quite generous. Or, or my, my sushi here, that, that visibly make me happy. And this is what I want to avoid, right? You want to get the good stuff, you want to avoid the bad stuff. That's the idea. If this is the case, then this is a little experiment from Paramecium. It's not about reward maximization. This is simply about being able to survive 
and, and have a branching point at which some less fortunate species disappear and the better ones will make it through. This is the point here where, for example, reward maximization could play a role. Okay? So we want to go a little bit more into detail. I'm, I'm, I want to see whether the dopamine responses reflect the physical value, the, amount, the milliliters, or whether they are actually tuned to what you need. That means subjective reward value. So we have the animal make a choice between two fractal stimuli. And these fractal stimuli tell you either, for example, you get um, an orange juice of a certain quantity. The height of the bar tells you how much you get. Or a risky orange juice, which is a little bit more and a little bit less than this here. You get, will get either this or either this if you choose this. And when you choose this, you will sure get, get this here, right? So the animal prefers this risky reward over the safe reward. I'll show you in a minute more details. And the animal prefers the same thing for the black currant juice, and it also prefers the black currant juice over the orange juice because they are all si the same amounts here. If you draw a line, it's all on the line, right? So the animal prefers these, has a certain preference among these juices, although everything gives exactly the same milliliter in liquid, right? Um, oh, sorry, here are the preferences. Um, the animal prefers this over this, the animal prefers this over this, and to be robust, you want to test uh, uh, transitivity, and you get strong stochastic transitivity. This preference here over the big, the big uh, difference here is bigger than the highest preference um, of the individual choices. Right? So this is consistent choices. Um, the, the, the animal shows that it has understood the ordinal relationship between these values, we can basically say that through the overt choices that we have elicit, that elicit these preferences, we are we can claim that this stimulus has more value than this stimulus, right? We can we can infer the value from the observable choices. You cannot measure value; it, it doesn't have a weight. You cannot put it in your hand, but you can put the choices in your hand. You can you can see them, and then you want to see what the dopamine neurons are doing, and they do exactly the same thing. So this is the response to this, to this reward here, the safe dispreferred reward, and that's the response to the lower, to the black current juice, to this safe reward here, right? And if we, so, so we see a value response. This neuron is sensitive to value. It is sensitive to, it, it has a higher response to the reward that is more preferred. This is the preference sign here. It has a higher response to black current juice compared to orange juice. And then let's see if this holds also for this risky outcome, and it sure does. That means the risk that is even more preferred than the individual singular rewards produce a higher response. This is not a risk response. This is the boosting of the value response by the risk, which is valued higher by the animal, as our choice preferences tell us. Okay, it's a very simple, straightforward experiment that tells us that dopamine neurons are coding reward value, and this is now subjective value that, com that comes in this case, not out of magnitude, we know that the neurons also increase their responses with reward magnitude, and they also, importantly, increase their response with reward probability. Right? Probability and magnitude for dopamine neurons are taken as the same kind of thing for value. Okay? So we want to get a little bit more into economic theory and have a little uh, thing, um, little text here. I'm sorry, this is boring. Uh, good for a na little nap. Uh, rewards are defined by behavior, their value is subjective, not physical, and the neuronal reward signals for the idea of parsimonious coding should code exactly the subjective value, not the objective. We should consider utility. Now I'm making a huge jump conceptually from these very ad hoc experiments that I just showed to a very cons uh, theory constrained term uh, called utility, and uh, these gentlemen were involved in um, generating these subjective, non, usually nonlinear function in which the same gain in objective value translates in a decreasing gain in utility, the law of decreasing marginal utility, right? When you're a millionaire, you don't bother too much for a dollar unless you're obsessive, as many are actually. And, and then you have the gentleman here that not too long ago um, followed this up with formal axioms that um, define utility under risk, which for us has been very beneficial to establish a utility function in monkeys, which I'll, you'll see in a minute. So utility can be inferred, utility as a form of value, from observable choices which elicit preferences. So you can observe the choice, you can measure the percentage of choice, you can deduce a probability of choice, 
And uh, you imagine that there are some preferences hidden in the brain that nobody knows, including yourself, but they get elicited, they become apparent in these choices. And from this thing, you can infer that there is a value behind. You cannot measure utility, right? And the good economists will tell you utility doesn't even exist because it's so complicated. Okay? In being a mathematical representation of preferences, utility predicts choices beyond the measured behavior in various sometimes limited conditions, including risk. And I'm going to show you um, that that claim works, which is very important for us, uh, in order to justify why we're not just doing these ad hoc subjective value assessments, this claim works um, with different forms of risk in the monkey. Right? So utility maximization is fine. And you would say the guy actually, he should get sated. His utility should decline. Right? Um, but but it, it increases. For him, it increases. So it means that more objective value is not just better, although he may think so. It's not necessarily better for him if you look from the outside and the question is what's good for him is whether we are to decide that or not is of course another question. What I'm trying to say here is that the objective value, the maximization of objective value is actually not the goal. The goal is the maximization of utility. The subjective value is what you want to have maximum from. Five stakes are not very good for you, uh, not much better than four stakes, are actually not very good for you. Usually after three stakes you've got enough. Okay, well, most of us. Um, so we're now doing, using von Neumann Morgenstern um, to get a numeric cardinal economic utility function for the simple reason that neuronal data are cardinal. You can say how much this actual, the, the spike is higher, the spike rate is higher in percentage than the spike rate in another situation, right? And this is what we need. And this is um, based on these von Neumann Morgenstern utility axioms. And we're not testing them here. We do test them, but we're not testing them in this experiment. What we do is we get a so-called certainty equivalent. This is a risky stimulus, a large reward or a small reward with 50% probability. And then we have a, that's fixed. And then we have a variable uh, uh, riskless uh, reward outcome that we can vary from the bottom to the top in what is called psychophysics. So we, we draw our gamble here. Uh, 0.1 to 0.4 milliliters of reward, and we establish a psychophysical function by starting with the reward at the bottom and gradually uh, uh, moving it up. And then we'll see that the probability of choosing this one here will initially be very little when it's low and will gradually increase as it goes high, as high here or, or even higher. Right? And then what we take as an important point is the certainty equivalent. That's the point here, the 50% certainty, the 50% um, choice between the safe and the risky reward. That tells us in the language of the safe reward, in the measure of the safe reward, how much the risky reward is worth subjectively to this animal, right? So this risky reward is actually worth a little bit more than the mean physical value, something like this here, what we see here, right? So the animal is actually putting a higher value in the risky stimulus. That's called risk seeking or risk prone. Then we can do the same thing with the same gamble, a little higher between 0.9 and 1.2 milliliters, and we see that the animal is actually having a lower certainty equivalent. The animal is risk avoiding in the high range, where it's risk seeking in the low range, which is important in, for the next slide because this is very funny, and the next result is also very funny, but they do match. We are now getting utility. We are doing a gamble. We do this gamble here. Now we don't titrate this. We just set well, we titrate it. We get the certainty equivalent um, at one point. This is the certainty equivalent for the gamble between 0 and 1.2 milliliters. Um, that is, by definition, 50% utility if the maximum is, one, is utility of 1. Then we take a gamble between the certainty equivalent and the original low value and get the new certainty equivalent, which by definition is a quarter utility. Then we do the thing with the upper part. That's three-quarter utility. And then we fill in the gaps and get a nice utility function, which is totally awkward. It is convex at the bottom, indicating risk seeking. It's linear here, indicating risk neutrality. And it's uh, concave up here, indicating risk avoidance. Very funny. Uh, human economists tell me that uh, this is called recreational gambling 
or the peanuts effect or whatever, the small change doesn't count. I calculated how much that is worth for a monkey. These 0 0.2, 3, 4, 5 milliliters to a monkey who receives 2 or 300 milliliters a day is worth about 10 pennies for somebody who has a salary of $30,000. Okay, so some people gamble with a few pennies. Actually, if you watch when you pay in your coffee shop, people throw away their, their um, dimes or, or their, their nickels or their pennies at least. Right? And uh, this funny risk profile coincides with the certain equivalence here. Um, we, we have with these specific tests, we see risk av uh, avoidance with high range, like this concavity and risk seeking in the low range. Right? So it seems to work. So we need to be sure what we're doing now, because now we're doing this fancy neurophysiology that costs a lot of money um, in, in the monkey. And we need to have this basic behavioral tests here all lined up, otherwise we are swimming. Right? Okay, so first, does this utility function predict different for, uh, behavior in different forms of risk? What we're actually doing is something very profound that Charlie Plott started here many years ago to get, together with, with uh, David Crether, is to see if the value that you're assessing from pricing some good is related or not to the choice preferences that you're expressing by choosing one over the other. And the result was that in many cases it doesn't work. And this idea that you elicit values from choices or prices from choices is actually problematic. I'll show you that in this situation, which is far less complicated than the human tests, it works actually. The, the two values, the two methods to elicit the value or to infer the value, that is the overt preferences um, and, and the certainty equivalent pricing, um, come to the same conclusion. Okay, here, here is the data. We take um, two gambles, each outcome is a probability of one-third. So if the animal chooses this option, it gets one of these three reward magnitudes with equal one-third probability, but just one, right? The next trial, he, may get, he will get the other one or, so, or whatever. Um, and that is the same thing here. They're just bigger, right? Larger. It's larger risk. This is defined by variance. There's no skewness in here. The mean value is the same. Expected val uh, value is absolutely perfect, right? So we're basing this on probability theory. I didn't want to show this. It's very straightforward. Once you get the probability theory going, everything is crystal clear. Uh, okay, so we're taking our utility function, which is from another monkey, which did a slightly different movement. So the utility function looks a little different, but it's still the same funny profile. And we're plotting our gamble in the x-axis here. This is the physical value of the gambles in milliliters. And then we, we calculate the utility by simply plotting it on this utility function, right? And we find that the expect utility for the red gamble is higher than for the blue gamble. That means the animal has a higher subjective value for the red gamble. And the choices do the same thing within limits, right? We're talking of a 70% over 30% choice, right? There are 30% dominated choices in this thing, but overall it seems to hold, okay? Then we want to see if this holds also for our risk avoidance part, and you can imagine what I'm going to show you, and it does hold, but as the difference is very small, the difference in preferences is also very small, okay? And uh, then we can do an out-of-sample test in which we plot a gamble here, read the expected utility, then actually test the gamble in choices and, and get, getting the certain, sorry, in certain equivalent and calculating the certain equivalent and then calculating it in utility. And these are gambles that we are not have not been used to establish the utility function and it works. An out of sample prediction that works pretty well. Okay? Then we do it for other kind of risk, in this case, skewness risk. This is um, an, an asymmetric probability distribution that has a, t a high outlier, positive skewness, or a low outlier, negative skewness. It's still one third each, right? But this is an, kind of an outlier compared to these two guys here, and this is a negative outlier, right? Same expected value, same variance, everything the same except the skewness. And then we plot this here, we see that the positive skewed gamble draws a large expected utility and the animal actually prefers this also. So again, this, this uh, coincidence. So the, we can predict with the utility function, low range variance risk seeking, high range variance risk avoidance, positive skewness seeking, negative risk seeking, ev everything. It complies with second, third order stochastic dominance. The same animal, we got that in several animals, is no problem. Okay? 
Um, and, oh, and we can see that this skewness thing, I'm, I'm, if you don't stop me here, I keep going. The skewness itself produces very nice transitive choices. Um, you get the skewed, positive skewed over the non-skewed, and non-skewed over the negatively skewed, all preferred, right? They prefer this, in this and the, the transitivity also works. And it's a, a strong st uh, transitivity, right? Now we want to go into neurons and do that a little bit more simple. Um, the mean variance spread of uh, Ritchell and Stieglitz is very helpful here. The best definition of, of variance risk we can find. A fantastic paper. Um, same, same expected value, different variance. This is more risky compared to this. Um, we plotted our utility function. That was a different animal. We measure the expected utility. We, we calculate expected utility. We look at the choices. It works. It's and the neurons do the same thing. The neurons show a larger response to the more risky gamble compared to the less risky gamble. Again, this is not a risk response. This is a response, a value response, that, that reflects the subjective value that the animal draws out of the risk as assessed by the certainty equivalence called pricing or the overt choices in, in a very um, congruent manner. Okay? So, well, this is what I just said, actually preference in a similar consistent way and the dopamine signal does so likewise. Okay, so let's, let's look at the dopamine neurons themselves. What do they do with utility? I'm sorry, I need to bore you with these definitions here. If you like that, read it. If you don't like it, you better not read it. Okay, this is what I'm saying here is that the dopamine signal is coding the utility, in, in fact, a prediction error in utility, and here are the data. That's our utility function, that's a linear curve, of course, and we see that the neurons, this, the vertical bar shows the amount of action potential normalized to a reward that is like 0.5 or 0.6 or something milliliters. And as we increase the reward size, we see that the uh, responses do not increase in this linear, linear manner, but they increase sluggishly, and then they kind of overshoot. And we can have some discussion about the underlying potential biological mechanism, which is quite quite nice, but from the phenomenology, we see that these neurons seem to code utility, and we have then, this is a terrible gamble, and we have defined our utility function from very well um, defined gambles, and so I have to say, I'm not going to show it, I have, we have this in this paper. The same dopamine utility prediction error signal e exists also when we test proper gambles with well-defined probabilities. We place several gambles, identical gambles, on the different positions of the utility function and, and then tested their responses. And they, of course, they show the largest response in the vertical part where the utility prediction error is the largest. It works very well. So it looks like that the reward prediction error of dopamine neurons is underdefined or underconstrained, and it is actually a utility prediction error. It's a reward prediction error signal in subjective utility. This is what I'm trying to do. And that, of course, is kind of an interesting implementation, physical implementation of this elusive construct of utility. You cannot measure utility, you cannot weigh it, but you can stick an electrode in the brain and you might be able to see it. Um, so this utility signal should then be useful for running decisions, making decisions. Um, before we go there, we have to emphasize that the dopamine signal is not just a nice correlation of signal. The dopamine signal actually has a consequence. The, the dopamine neurons, the stimulation of dopamine neurons produces choice preferences. Here we did optogenetics uh, in the monkey in which we inserted uh, chanorhodopsin in a wild type naive monkey and we got a 37% um, efficacy which is not terrible but which is not so bad but most importantly 95% specificity. Then we recorded dopamine neurons with the electrode while we gave laser light through this glass fiber and we could drive a few dopamine neurons, most dopamine neurons we could not drive in a one-to-one -one manner, which is kind of important. That explains a lot of effects that people see in mice in, in which they don't record the dopamine neurons. We can then um, produce a reward, a drop of liquid, and get a response in the neurons, and then we add the optogenetic stimulation to the same amount of reward here, we get a bigger response. Okay, the neurons are catching this response here. That could, of course, be a direct effect, whatever. Then we can um, get stimuli, train stimuli that predict the reward, a tr single drop of reward plus the optogenetic stimulation, another stimulus that predicts reward without the additional stimulation. Same amount of reward, the response is stronger 
to this blue stimulus compared to the red stimulus, right? As if the neurons are predicting now more reward, and that more comes from that optogenetic simulation. So, and that translates into behavior. We can then have these two stimuli, one with the optogenetics, one without the optogenetics, and the animal will ultimately, over a few trials, come to prefer the blue stimulus over here, which is the one that gives them the same liquid, but a bit more of the dopamine stimulation. So the dopamine stimulation is eff actually effective in, draw in producing a response as if it were a value. Right? And that, of course, confirms um, 50 years of electrical self-stimulation in rodents that has also been carried over into the optogenetic field, which works very well. So here, um, what does this reward prediction error signal in dopamine neurons um, indicate? Um, we, we have a certain prediction of reward, and reward varies within this range of the prediction, with the narrow range, we can't discriminate anything. We won't get a particular simulation out of it. Um, we won't get a response in dopamine neurons, right? If we, however, have a reward that exceeds that prediction here, we get a positive prediction or response in dopamine neurons, and we know that that stimulates the electrical self-stimulation, just as I've shown in the monkey, right? Here, it produces learning approach satisfaction. The self-stimulation, re Alma repeatedly pressing the lever in order to get that shock, and 50% of these sites in the brain are actually linked to the dopamine system, as Roy Weiss showed in 1980. And, but then the, the fatal thing is, or whatever you call it, that this stimulus also, of course, in the terms of the reinforcement model, increases the prediction, right? You have a prediction error that increases the prediction, and the prediction goes up a little bit. And now a reward that is larger than the prediction before is now within the current prediction. It will not produce such a dopamine response. You don't get that. What you need is another reward that's bigger than that new prediction in order to get a dopamine response and produce learning and satisfaction. And that again drives your prediction above. So you have a kind of a fatal circle where you always want more. You always want more to get the same amount of satisfaction. Here at the end of the day, when you follow this, this is a negative prediction error that pulls it down a little bit, very depressing. Uh, when you see these rewards here, they produce absolutely nothing. They're far higher than before where they have produced a stimulation. This is the idea that you need always more reward. Well, it's fatal on one kind, well, not fatal, but it's very terrible. It makes you move for more reward. It produces wanting, something that the Buddhists really don't want. People don't want, Buddhists don't want that people want always something. They should be happy with what they have, right? On the other hand, it produces more reward. You want to have more of, Sorry, you want, to have, you want to have more of this stimulation and, and you're trying to get more and more and ultimately it will make you get more reward. It's a neuronal mechanism of utility maximization without any theory behind other than reinforcement lear learning. Right? And so Peter Sterling alerted me to this fact of everyday life applications. You, you, you all, everybody has the same car in your neighborhood and suddenly somebody buys a Mercedes and then everybody else wants also the Mercedes because their own car are not worth anything anymore and they, they need this bigger car, right? And then everybody has a Mercedes and then need a Rolls Royce and then need an airplane and then, uh, I don't know, a golf course and something. Okay, Goethe said nothing is harder to bear than a succession of fair days where there's no prediction error. Oh, no positive prediction, of course. Freud, uh, we are so made that we can derive intense enjoyment only from a contrast and very little from a case, oh, I can't read here, I have my reading class, very little from a state of things, right? So you want to have these prediction errors to get a kick out of it in daily life. And that may explain why we have all these phenomena of all these higher wages and everybody's unhappy if they don't get more, right? Okay, so, uh, I want to go a little bit further. I have another two hours here, I understand. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about formal approaches of uh, utility maximization. Uh, we see in, in Singapore um, this nice statues where somebody trades in two amounts of something for three amounts of something. Uh, call, it, call it wheat, uh, two bushels of wheat for 300 grams of meat or something like that. Right? What I'm trying to do is what the title says, that the biological rewards can save as, uh, serve as tradable economic goods, and then, of course, implying that the same behavioral mechanisms function and the same neuronal mechanisms function. That means we can test biological rewards with economic theory, and we can apply economic theory to testing um, ec um, uh, biological rewards. It's all the same thing. Right? It's just different kind of 
different aspects, right? So here we had a long-term discussion with Charlie Plot about using what's called the indifference curves of reveal preference theory um, testing in our monkeys. The idea is that every reward has two components, sweetness and, and liquid or something, and that th these two components need to be taken into account for a proper assessment of reward value, and that you can experimentally address this by having a so-called bundle that has explicit two identifiable, individually variable rewards, like certain amounts of blackcurrant juice with certain amounts of, of grape juice. So we can, for example, say that the animal receives 0.4 milliliters of, of um, blackcurrant juice and 0.2 milliliters of grape juice, and he has a choice against 0.2 milliliters of blackcurrant juice, a little less blackcurrant juice, but he gets a bit more of grape juice. Or maybe he's tired of that blackcurrant juice, or maybe he likes this variety. So the animal may, may choose this or may choose this. And at some point, he may even get less blackcurrant juice and even more grape juice. And if the animal chooses each one of them equally, we have what's called an indifference curve. Then the subjective value, which is called utility, of every one of these three bundles is absolutely the same. That's, they have equal utility. That's the indifference curve. That's where you have choice and difference in your psychophysical function, right? We've done that experiment with psychophysical function with our bars and have had these compounds, these bundles um, as choice options. And then you can continue, uh, do a bit more. You can have, uh, give more physical reward, which of course, with a positive monotonic value function, you have higher utility. You can give more, less than you have a lower utility. And the idea is that everything on the same line then has the same utility and everything on the different lines have different utility, increasing utilities, in fact, here to the right. And that is not just a theory that works very well. Here we have our blackcurrant juice and grape juice, and we get these indifference curves with the certainty, with the um, confidence intervals on the side. So we have one, two, three, four, five, actually. This is Alex uh, Pastor Bernier who did these heroic experiments, heroic in the sense of accumulating, I think, uh, 60,000 indifference of these indifference points with a total of 15 different rewards. For example, you can get more convexity when you have rewards that add up to each other and increase in a synergistic way their value, then you need less liquid to have the same indifference curve here. This is monosodium glutamate and inositol monophosphate, which when given together because, uh, just boost your um, um, taste of, of these two liquids. Um, you can take a less interesting liquid water and then for the indifference curves you just need to supply more water to get the same utility. And then you can take my favorite, your terrible yogurt. This is the white yogurt with this greenish liquid leaking out that so your wife tells you is really healthy to eat in the morning and that you hate and take every excuse to not eat it. If you want to have this animal eat more of this horrible yogurt, you have to give him more blackcurrant juice. I'm not just making fun of my monkeys here. Well, actually, I'm not making fun of the monkeys. The monkeys have a choice. They don't need to eat that crap, right? They, but, but they do if you give them more blackcurrant juice. What it shows is that these curves are not just random events or nice theory or so. It works. Um, this is a very mean, this is the mo probably the most meaningful curve that we got. Well, we did some um, satiety, which looks kind of similar also, but it's more complicated to interpret. This is very straightforward. It shows that these indifference curves actually make perfect sense. Sense in, this, in, in the way that the animal gets really what is best for it. So we're getting close to our utility maximization. And, and then we want to test the boring thing, do um, transitivity. We want to see these are util, um, these indifference curves. This is higher, intermediate, lower, very low utility, right? Indifference curves, everything the same utility. So C has a higher utility than B, than, than A. Uh, they should be preferred in that sequence. And they are, right? 90% and B to C, and then transitivity. So it's not a random choice that we're seeing. In fact, what I'm trying to tell you, higher utility translates literally in higher preferences, and these preferences are not random, but they're systematic. And then Charlie Plot came and said, well, guys, wait, wait, wait a minute. You forgot something. We are not there yet at utility maximization. You want to use Arrow's weak axiom of real preferences. And if you read that paper, you need about one hour per line to understand it unless you're totally familiar with set theory, which I have been when I was 300 years ago a student, but not now. So Charlie said, well, this is the way it is. And then we plotted it, and here it is. You get, um, the idea is if you reduce your choice set from, for example, three options to two options, 
um, that's the minimal condition, then your preferences should not change for the most preferred reward. So here we have a three choice set and we of course have the, the indifference curves. We know exactly what the animal would probably prefer. The X prefer over the Y and the Z and maybe they would be equal between these two guys, right? So that preference here, the X preferred over the Y should also stay valid when we use the smaller choice set, right? This two choice set here and it works perfectly well. And we've done another experiment, it works all well. It, it just works. The reason why this works is not that our monkeys are smarter than humans. The reason is why we is because we're using very simple tests in which there is little, much less ambiguity and much less chance for interpreting another attribute of these rewards into the choice, which is usually the, the reason why humans show these irrational behaviors and violate uh, this weak axiom of real preferences. Okay? Good. Then we have an, another, I think my time is running a little short here. Um, I, I want to show that the dopamineurs are not alone in the world. They are parts of a network of this is a bit schematic and a bit re reductionist. Other reward structures like the striatum to which they project, the amygdala to which they project, and the orbital frontal cortex to which they project, but they have connections among each other also. It's a network in which literally all these red connections do exist anatomically as axons. Right? So I want to go through a little bit through these um, structures to show that um, the whole idea of, of dopamine fits into a larger network of reward. We're going with the most simple decision model, the so-called winner-take-all mechanism with two inputs. So we have one set of neurons that are coding the value of one option and another set that code the value of the other option. And these uh, neurons are connected forward by excitation and reciprocally like lateral inhibition um, with inhibition. This is the so-called winner-take-all mechanism. At the end of the day, and if you, put, you need to put a threshold in here also, at the end of the day, the stronger input, this is stronger compared to that, will win and determine the output. And in terms of the dopamine neurons and, and the, sorry, this is a network for striatum. In terms of the, the striatal network, we would then think that somewhere the D1 and D2 carrying uh, striatal neurons are involved. And for those that work in the basal ganglia, that's a big deal. The D1 are excitatory for behavior and D2 are inhibitory for behavior. You cannot get away without uh, um, mentioning this. And then, of course, you could get what's called a chosen value coding by uniting the signals from both options. And that's important, in a, we'll see in a second, for reinforcement. The dopamineurs are, are coding the chosen value. We have tested that in a separate experiment, which I'm not showing. So what happens is the, the option value B is higher. It's winning the competition. It will, the, the, the appearance of that option will produce what's called an eligibility trace and the output from this here will maintain that eligibility trace. The other option that is kind of degenerating now, doesn't do anything, will not maintain the eligibility trace and this eligibility trace will decay. And that's the important point. At that point later, the reward occurs and it meets a, exist, an existing eligibility trace but it does not meet anything here for the other option. So you have a chosen value, unspecific, unselective dopamine response that influences every neuron in here, in, in this network, but it will only act on reinforcing, on strengthening the association of this neuron here because the eligibility trace is still there. This neuron will, change, will not change anything because the eligibility trace has disappeared. This is the anatomy where the, the plasticity happens here um, in that case, but not for, for, for this neuron here. Okay? So in that way, the dopamine signal, which is kind of spread in an unselective manner to all postsynaptic neurons, may have a um, selective effect. That's my speculation. It's not totally wrong, but of course, there's a lot of pieces missing in that puzzle. Right? This is the idea here that then later this value is updated. The updating function of dopamine on postsynaptic decision networks. All right? Okay, let's go to another structure. Amygdala. Of course, it's a fear structure, right? We'll show you it's more than that. We're doing the most basic test for value coding called contingency, the awful and ambiguous word with a very simple and specific meaning in learning theory that is making reward prediction dependent on more reward. So here is the idea. We give a stimulus and we give drops of reward doing that stimulus, but not outside of the stimulus. And we get a response 
to that stimulus, which of course here in the amygdala, we then give reward also outside of the stimulus. The same reward stays, the same stimulus stays here, but the response disappears. And we know there is, exists no more prediction because the stimulus has no specific meaning for the animal. The animal gets the reward anyway, all the time. And we can reverse this by now, look at this. There's no response here. We are lowering the reward outside of that stimulus. Nothing changes in here. The whole thing is the same here. We are lowering the reward outside of the, st of the stimulus and the response appears, right? We're not doing anything physically th to that stimulus. That is a very nice result. It's the first result ever anybody has seen uh, contingent in the brain. And it shows that we're not having a, a visual stimulus here because otherwise we would have a response here. And for those of you, I, I know it's hardly anybody, who quarrel sometimes with journals for getting papers accepted or rejected or so, I can tell you we tried all major journals here that we could find all the fancy journals because this is the most fundamental thing in learning theory, more, more fundamental than prediction error, and all journals rejected it basically saying everything is known already. Okay, so don't desperate. If you get bad responses, just keep trying. We published it in the Journal of Neurophysiology, which is kind of my house journal. Anyway, okay, we just liked it. It was a really cool experiment. In fact, I, I developed that experiment on one of my stays in Caltech. I don't tell the economists. I did some non-economics here, and it took me, I don't know, a couple of weeks to tease it out until it was as clean as this one here. Okay, um, if we talk of object value, five minutes, sure. If you talk of object value coding in the amygdala as postsynaptic structure, we need to show it, and that does it. We have this, um, we make the animal do a choice between reward A and reward B, two options, and we see that the neuron is tracking the value of um, the object A. This is low, intermediate, large value, and the response uh, is the same here. You can see it here, and then we do a reinforcement model to um, estimate the reward value and look at the neural activity. We see a pretty nice following. Okay, so, and then the, the object value B is not tracked. We see that in the regression model. I'm not going to bore you with this. And the action value, which is another definition, is also not tracked by these neurons, right? Well, this is amygdala, which is supposed to be reward and stimulus driven and not movement driven. So I'm not surprised of this object value coding rather than action value coding, but, but it works. Okay. Um, well, then we had a very complex choice task 10 years, more than 10 years ago, and never published it in which the animal could sp spend a reward that has accumulated through repeated choices or save more reward and get more reward later with an interest rate. Okay, very complex task, several trials in a row, one of the most complex tasks we ever used, hopeless to interpret, except that some data makes sense. So what you get then, among many other types of responses in the amygdala, we're not talking of prediction error, we're not talking of dopamine, I'm just talking of reward processing in a nice structure that's known for fear responses. The value coding initially doing an individual trial which lasts eight seconds, that means the animal sees the stimulus, makes a choice, and then again and again and again. And then later in that trial, the choice activity becomes significant in the uh, multiple linear regression, right? So you see in the, elite, in the individual neuron, a transition from value to choice coding. This is a very nice structure, brain structure, for economic decision making. It's not just about fear, right? Don't worry, okay? Um, let's keep going a little bit more. Um, orbital frontal cortex, this area of the brain here. We have, the, present the animal a piece of cereal, a, a stimulus that predicts a piece of cereal, another stimulus that predicts a piece of apple, we know that the animal prefers the apple over the cereal, but, um, but, but we're not testing in choices. We test the individual trials, right? It's a block of trials in which the animal gets 20 or 40 trials, half of them this year, half of them this year, and we see higher activity with the apple. Very nice, an apple neuron, right? No, not an apple neuron, sorry. A second block in which there's no more cereal, but we alternate between apple and raisin. We make the animal occasionally choose. We know the animal prefers raisin over apple and the apple neuron is gone. Same stimulus, same piece of apple, everything the same, but the neuron now responds to raisin, right? We have a shifting reference dependent coding. It looks like this is one of the first examples of subjective value. Physically, it's the same thing, but the neuron does something differently, right? This is the better thing. You get, you get these, refer these relative preferences, right? No problem, okay? Works very well. Um, 40 out of 60 neurons in orbital frontal cortex tests like that did it, the others didn't care. So don't say orbital frontal cortex does reference-dependent coding. Some neurons do it, other neurons don't do it, okay? 
Um, risk, oh, I talked about risk, right? I talked about my mean preserving spread stimulus. So we present this stimulus to the animal, or that stimulus, or that stimulus, and then later it gets the output, the top or the bottom. And what we see is that the increasing variance here produce an increasing response, and these neurons are not um, coding value. There are different neurons that code the value in this, in this case, I think, two, two separate linear regressions for some reason um, show uh, value coding and risk coding almost separate in this brain area. So we have a risk signal in the orbital frontal cortex that got nothing to do with the value, including not to do with the potential maximum value that the animal might think because of some fancy probability distortion or something. Okay? Uh, social, that's my last, uh, my last couple of slides. Uh, social, animals are social. They are attracted to each other, they have value, and they, have, they see value in particular actions that they do to others and that they receive from others. Okay? We're not going to do this uncontrolled experiment. We're going to, cho to, to um, game theory. We're doing a modified dictator game. I don't scream, it's really not a dictator game, but it's kind of. The animal sees two drops of liquid he gets himself and two drops of liquid that the other animal gets when he touches this panel. And then they change roles and this guy sees these stimuli and this gets here. And of course we can vary the numbers here, right? So th then, then this animal is moving to get his own reward and he's moving to get the other guy the reward, right? Um, uh, we did choices here, they were not as clear cut um, as the, um, some people uh, explain, we, we, we had a lot of variation in this choice behavior, how the animal would give the other more reward than himself or less reward or something. Not so easy in the laboratory. In the animal house, it's much different. Okay, anyway, um, we record in the stratum here. We see a neuron that signals the own reward, and that 77% of the neurons in the stratum are interested in the own reward. They are they have an increase in activity when they get more own reward in, in a regression. Quite a complicated model. When both animals are rewarded, the neuron increases. And when the actor itself gets a reward, it also increases. Well, in this case, both get a reward. The actor gets a reward. And here, it gets a reward. When only the conspecific gets a reward, there's no activity. And when nobody gets a reward, there's no activity either. Right? And the interesting point, so kind of egoistic, egocentric reward processing, the interesting point now is that this depends, this activity, the same activity, depends in different neurons on who is doing the action. Two-thirds of the neurons are active only when this guy gets the reward and he does the action. The other one-third, a bit more, 40% of neurons are only active when this, guy does, when this guy does the action and he gets the reward. We're recording in this animal here, right? So this is the conspecific doing the action to get this guy his reward. This conspecific sees the stimuli, of course, on his side, right? Okay, so a very actor-dependent social reward. Okay, and here is my last slide. Um, and I, you, you get enough when you see that slide, I'm, I'm sure. Um, uh, you won't have any more, you want to see any more slides. We're doing observational learning now. That is not a particular game. The reward, the stimuli predict 0.2 or 0.8 probability of reward for this guy and these stimuli for this guy, right? So these are fractals, intrinsically arbitrary, neutral. Monkey A learns these two stimuli to distinguish and he picks up the better one, uh, which is this one here. Um, after a while, some learning, no problem, okay? And then monkey B picks up his stimuli, right? He, picks up, he, he does rubbish, and then he, then he picks it up, right? This guy is a bit better, um, okay? And then, then we switch the stimuli. So this guy is now getting the stimuli, and he knows already which is the better stimulus, because the probability stays, and then there is retention. The animal learns these new stimuli very quickly, and this guy also learns the new stimuli very quickly. I have to say, this happens in about 60% of cases, and there are 40% of cases where we just don't see the effect of observational learning, and we don't really know what the difference is. The interesting point is that this observational learning, of course, this retention thing here, overall is significant. You benefit from observing what the other guy is doing, and when you go in the amygdala, now that's the point that we're working on right now, you can predict in for, increase, for a increasing number of neurons increasingly better what the other animal is going to do 
when, which stimulus the animal is going to test based on your own experience. So you can predict the, social act, the action of a social agent from your own experience with these stimuli, knowing that the, this social agent is using the stimuli that you have experienced yourself. So when you see a guy outside drinking a, a pint of beer that you've told him before, you realize you, you can, well, he goes to the bar, you can realize that this guy's going to get that beer because you told him that's good beer and you experienced it yourself, right? Okay, thank you very much. My very simple conclusions, the monkey's choices follow basic definitions of uh, uh, economic theories. Um, the dopamine reward prediction error signal, of course, was, is a teaching signal. It's beautiful. The whole learning literature um, are very interested. But what we are interested, what I'm actually interested in with the kind of a evolutionary perspective is that these concepts of reinforcement learning, economic decision theory are suitable for maximizing reward utility. This is really the thing that you want. And learning, of course, is a tool, and updating is a tool to get maximum reward utility. And dopamine neurons are part of a brain network. They're not alone in the brain to cause reward of reward structures, which are the ones, major ones I mentioned, not the only ones, that are involved in learning and economic decision, individual and social agents. Thank you very much. For the individual yeah. neurons, you. you don't have a uh, so preference. <laughs> so for the uh, orbital prefrontal cortex so experiment, so over there, so you recorded individual neurons. You didn't see the objective uh, preference for the individual neurons. If you are doing, if you can do the population recording, so what do you expect? It? There's a group of the neurons have a preference to the certain so the objective or so there's a different so coding mechanism for in the orbital prefrontal cortex for for the reward. Did you get that? I'm, I'm not sure I, I got the. the I, I'm sure I, I understood enough. So the for the for in the for the uh, orbital uh, orbital prefrontal cortex so that the the result so you're showing for the individual neurons there's no preference for the single. Stim, uh, single objective like. Did you say visual? I, I'm, I'm sorry, visual? Why, why is it visual? The orbital the, prefrontal cortex. Oh, the orbital frontal. Yeah. So yeah. for the individual neurons, you didn't see the, the preference to the, the objective. The pattern is objective. No, so the individual neurons. Yes. Individual neurons, you didn't see the preference. Can, so can to the to the <laughs> to the stimuli, like for example, so the the case you are you are showing, so individual neurons don't. There's no apple neuron. There's no apple neurons. There's a no. So no. So the there's no apple neurons. The apple neurons will also later so response to the the pressing. But if you are if you can do the population recording. So is there a group of neurons so encoding the information to to act to code the apple sig signal instead of the racing signals. A group of neurons do risk coding, and another group of neurons yeah. do value coding, yeah. and that is related to preferences. Yeah. I think yeah. Maybe uh, you mean that um, if you looked at the population of cells, yes. you still see, uh, see a distinct signature for apple. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, even though uh, yeah. single neurons just only code that. That would be object-specific neurons like Apple neurons. Yes. Um, that would, um, based on taste or on smell or, or whatever physical, it would be based. Um, we were deliberately more anterior than where you would expect these neurons. The, the general idea is you have olfactory and gustatory neurons in the posterior orbital frontal cortex, even in the three layer or four layer uh, cortex uh, before it becomes real six layer. And then as you go more forward, you get these more abstract neurons. So Edmund Rolls has shown 
uh, literally reward uh, type, reward object specific responses that were maybe not even related to, to value. They just said, this is an apple, this is a piece of banana or something. And as we go forward, we were not even looking for these neurons, but the neurons that I said, the 20 out of the 60 that did not show this reference dependent coding, they may have been these neurons. But we have not tested that very much. What we've also tested is um, the specificity for, for visual stimuli. And we, had, we even had a uh, figure published which showed that the, there was no specificity for the visual stimuli in the, some, in the group of neurons and they only followed the reward values. You, you could have three different visual stimuli that predict one reward and they respond to all of these stimuli and then you have three other stimuli that predict no reward and, and they don't respond to that or predict another reward and they don't respond to that, to that reward. Um, but we may have missed neurons that are objects or even visual specific. In fact, we saw a few visual neurons which we couldn't really interpret because we didn't test them enough. We were focused on the other thing. And Earl Miller told me that he had seen uh, visual neurons in the orbital frontal cortex. And when we looked back at the data, we said, yeah, we, we kind of overlooked them or neglected them, and they are there. It's not a lot. Uh, and I think the more posterior you go, the more you get object-specific. That could be visual or particular gustatory or olfactory neurons. Yes. So the orbital frontal cortex is a super complicated heterogeneous structure, right? The risk neurons are 11%, and people, of course, in doing the uh, um, editing of the, of the paper um, made bad comments about it. The value in our hands is like 20%. Other people report 60% of value neurons in orbital frontal course. We just don't find that. And, and then you get so many other neurons, and, and probably lots of social neurons that are totally unexplored, unexplored and unknown. It's a very interesting structure that has been now beaten into value coding and economic decision tasks, and I think there's far more in it. I think that should probably answer your question. Uh, so, sorry. Okay. Uh, so Wolfram, um, uh, you talked about the you know the reward and utility for for you know positive things, but I guess another aspect is. Um, <coughs> you know, costs and negative things. So could you say a little bit about how those signals might be encoded? Are they in dopamine? Are they elsewhere? Are they integrated somehow? Yeah, yeah. The, the, well, the first thing is that the aversive stimuli that activate do some dopamine neurons, groups of dopamine neurons, are actually not driven by the aversiveness if the proper control tests have been done, but are driven by the physical impact of that stimulus. That is, we know that dopamine neurons have at least two response components, and the first one is an early component that responds to the physical impact. And so far, I have not seen any neuron that was tested under this um, aspect that actually maintained an aversive negative value response in that case. Although people, you can easily find a response to an aversive stimulus if, you, if the stimulus is strong enough. Um, for the val I would think that the, 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 the loss would be coded as a negative prediction error, as a negative value. We are trying to, to do losses with all kinds of tricks and monkeys, and we cannot get it working properly, not in the way we want to do it, uh, not get economic loss. I know that people are doing these, um, uh, what is it, Dial Lee, these little dots that disappear and go up and down and so. But we couldn't get the behavioral test as much as we liked it to do. We actually have a graduate student that was really adamant to get that working. And uh, well, we're doing several things at the same time, so he kind of switched to something else that, that actually goes easier. Yeah. Um, I'm sure amygdala neurons would code aversive stimuli. And this, this eternal question, with reward is easy. Rewards and goods is the same thing. But is punishment and loss the same thing? So rewards and goods and gain, I think that's an easy connection. But is a, is a punishment and a loss the same thing to an animal? An economic loss, is, is that the same thing as a punishment or not? And I don't, I'm not sure that's quite clear, because some neurons respond to aversive stimuli. Plenty in the amygdala, for example, the famous re, uh, fear responses. Is that always considered as a, probably a loss? But uh, it's, it's, I, I don't know. Final quick question. Uh, you've, you've been coming here for every spring for several years. What do you enjoy doing at Caltech and what brings you back? 
I, what I enjoy in Caltech is my colleagues with whom I have very open discussions once a week, twice a week. I go back to the textbooks. I come, initially I came with two packages of textbooks, which I have now focused on. Actually, I bought many textbooks here through Amazon, and then I came with these textbooks. Now I come with a big bag of about 10 textbooks, which are my core textbooks. And then I read and talk to Charlie and to Federico and to you and to and then, then the newer economists, uh, Antonio and, and uh, John and so. And then, but then I'm, I'm mostly interested in these theories, in these experimental economics. And then is utility cardinal, ordinal, does it exist? Why doesn't it exist? And things like this. These definitions, I think, is what I like. I can talk. And I can find that back in my textbooks. And I can think about it. And I don't always agree with everybody. Or they don't agree with me, let's say. Uh, but uh, th that's what brings me back. And of course, one part is that I'm a little bit away from the laboratory because you cannot in the lab, I cannot sit in the laboratory and work three hours on, a, on one PowerPoint graph to get it right. That is then the experimental design. We rather play around until it works. But getting it down and sitting for two hours, separate from a laboratory, having basically as much time as I want and enjoying it tremendously is very difficult to do daily in the laboratory. That's why people take sabbaticals, but I never took a sabbatical of like a half a year or, or nine months. I never did that. I'm just too anxious for my laboratory. But you can do a short period. And we don't even charge tuition for bringing all your books. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Don't, don't, don't say that too loud. <laughs> your chairman is here. <laughs>